So good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone who's come along to this session of the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access and Libraries. We're one of the various dynamic coalitions at the Internet Governance Forum, built around the idea that as we look to ensure that everyone has the possibility to connect to the Internet, that public access, and this is access understood as access through public centres such as libraries, but potentially also other telecentres, has an important role both in giving people who don't have the opportunity to connect at home the chance to get online, but also as a complement to private access. So we bring together people who are from the library sector, you can guess from the title, and I'm from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, from IFL, who works a lot to develop connectivity and library capacity, especially in developing countries, <laughs> and others across the technical, the NGO sector, who are particularly interested in the potential of this. Now, a year or so ago, evidence from the Stanford deliberative polling exercise showed that of all of the means of getting the next billions online, public access was one of the lowest hanging fruit. As we have this pre-existing network, the question then is, well, how do we use it? How do we realize this possibility? And I hope that this session today will help us move in that direction. So I'm going to hand over to Valeria Betancourt, who's going to be our moderator for today. Thank you very much. Uh, Emerald, will you introduce the toolkit uh, a little bit? If, if, if we have Emerald who will introduce the toolkit that is at the moment in development and will frame the discussion of the panel. So good morning, everyone. Uh, so the session is centered around this uh, public access toolkit that the International Federation of Library Association and the DC PAL uh, list uh, um, developed over um, the past few months. The idea is to provide um, librarians um, at the national, regional, you know, local level um, a, a, a set of rules, a set of tools to uh, advocate for public access in their uh, region. And um, the reason why um, we develop it is that uh, we know that public access, um, public internet access in libraries is a real good and, uh, and libraries have been uh, providing that access for centuries, right? But um, access to knowledge, I mean. But uh, of course, with the advent of the digital infrastructure, things got a little bit more um, complicated, if you will. And um, so the landscape now includes, in our opinion, and that we here to seek uh, a suggestion of any kind, um, the landscape now includes infrastructure, so how it is important and how it changes uh, uh, public access, um, includes finance, of course, and includes um, regulatory um, 
um, bodies in general, and then um, privacy and um, legal aspects. So we structured and we created this, uh, we developed these four uh, topics, um, always having the libraries in mind. And we are now on our second draft, I would say. Uh, the second draft will be available uh, on the IGF website uh, for you to comment and send any suggestions you may have to make this really a uh, worthwhile uh, tool for libraries. So um, the first round was sent to the DCPAL list and to the IFLA, International Federation of Library Association Committees, and we incorporated those uh, uh, suggestions. So now the second iteration is, um, is also the reason why we're here. We have experts and we hope uh, uh, to gather from them important information, but from all of you. So please, if you have any suggestions, send it to us via the link that you will find on the IGF website or contact us, uh, just to meet with us after this session and um, hopefully the toolkit will be ready in a few months and will be useful for libraries and librarians um, alike worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Esmeralda. As the toolkit, uh, as you have heard, the toolkit aims to provide a practical guide to empower librarians with the knowledge necessary to discuss and advocate for public internet access. So the, the panel will focus on identifying issues and recommendations to overcome the policy, regulatory, and financial barriers to providing public access to the internet. And we have a set of four experts that will touch upon different aspects, particularly around what it entails to make public uh, access easy, affordable, and scalable, and will suggest some ideas also on what policies should be prioritized. So I will ask each speaker to introduce themselves when uh, it's their turn to, to speak. And, and then to address a specific issue. So let me start with Don Means. So Don, if you can please introduce yourself and also uh, let us know a little bit what are the most promising developments at the moment in terms of technologies, particularly at the level of infrastructure that could bring libraries and users online. So you have the floor, please. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, good morning. Uh, libraries are fascinating in that uh, they represent an intersection of perhaps more issues related to connectivity and access and speech and privacy and infrastructure uh, than maybe any other uh, institution or possible topic. Uh, I, I just wanted to touch on the infrastructure component for a moment, if I could, and that is uh, that the, the connectivity infrastructure is always composed of both wired and wireless uh, uh, elements and most all of us connect directly end users with wireless uh, but there's always a wire line somewhere behind that uh, whether there's the cell connections or the Wi-Fi uh, routers that we're connected to here right now um, how this evolves and the economics of it I think someone else is going to address uh, but generally speaking uh, the uh, wireless offers the ubiquity uh, and mobility generally and then the wireline offers the, the reliability and the capacity uh, that uh, the networks rely on um, and I want to make this point about connectivity versus capacity as we look to reach farther out into uh, communities and markets and uh, that is that uh, wireless is generally less expensive and can reach farther faster. Uh, people would like to have uh, 4K cat videos, of course, or whatever, uh, all the time, but uh, generally the applications that are most valuable to most people don't require the greatest capacity, uh, mail, basic web pages, even video conferencing can be done at a half a megabit per second very well. So the point is to uh, extend the infrastructure farther as soon as possible and allow that uh, wireless will pull fiber behind it. We have an example of one of our projects in, uh, in Kansas that was using wireless to extend a, uh, luckily, a fiber connection to the library. 
uh, out into uh, hot spots in the community. And uh, these were public places, uh, senior center, uh, public park, and uh, a recreational center. And uh, they were very popular. These are, this is library Wi-Fi. Uh, hundreds of millions of people depend on library Wi-Fi for their access, either entirely or at least partially. And everyone likes it. Uh, it's extremely popular. And what happened in this case was that uh, at certain periods of the year, more data was flowing through these remote access points than through the library itself. What that did was uh, allow the community uh, the city government, as a matter of fact, to justify running fiber connections to these facilities uh, as an upgrade. And so uh, this is kind of the point, is that libraries can act as uh, lead users, advanced users of technology, and demonstration sites uh, for uh, uh, other technologies and for building out infrastructure uh, to and through the library, uh, we like to say. So this is uh, the last point I'd want to make about infrastructure is the, that uh, uh, the more shared infrastructure is, the more efficient and effective it is. Uh, and we, th these, are, these are things we build in common, our roads, our other systems. We all use them and it doesn't matter whether that's uh, water in a public facility or water in a, in a home, it's the same system and it's the same with with uh, communications infrastructure uh, and the efficiencies are to, to build uh, shared infrastructure and using libraries and other anchor institutions, schools, clinics, and so forth uh, as, inter as both endpoints serving at least half the population, at least in the U.S., uh, then offers a way to uh, interconnect with those points and extend it further to reach homes and offices in the whole community, so-called middle mile. And this has proven a very uh, effective way to develop uh, infrastructure and, a, and an important role for libraries to play. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Certainly, um, infrastructure sharing strategies is a must, and particularly in the context of developing countries. So thank you for those remarks. Next, I have uh, Roger Begg. Um, Roger, if you can also let us know where you come from, a little bit about you, and if you can provide some examples of countries where regulation favors the development of public access solutions. It could be very nice for the discussion. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm Roger Batch. I'm coming from a new state, not even recognized by the UN, called Catalonia. Uh, I'm, I was invited not for this, but because I participate since more than a decade in a community network. A community networks uh, is linked with what Don was explaining at the last. It's uh, the people, the citizens taking action to build their own infrastructure <laughs> to reach the closest internet access. And in most of the cases, at least in Gifinet, in the early days, it, the, this uh, connection was the library, the local library in the villages. Uh, yeah, this raises uh, a lot of uh, uh, questions regarding legal aspects and regulation, regulatory aspects, especially for those who make the, inter the connection available. Huh? We have this uh, civil uh, liability, the secondary liability. Uh, secondary liability is about uh, if somebody infringes copyrights, for instance, copyright, uh, uh, copyright uh, and rights, uh, the first liability is that one who made the, uh, the illegal use of the, the copyrights, but the secondary liability is those who made or helped to make this possible. And in this case, if you make available the internet connection that was used to infringe the, 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 the law, maybe you have problems. Uh, one of the questions we, we were proposed is, is, is um, where to start with, and where to begin with. Uh, from our experience, we can say that the best way to start with is, is uh, uh, just do something, share something, then we, we will start facing uh, problems, and little by little, it, uh, we will build knowledge. I can understand that a, a, a village librarian is someone that has many other uh, occupations and to be an, a law expert, we, the citizens are neither law experts, so it's just by practice that we can learn. 
in most of the countries, and this was the second question we were pro I, I was proposed, if I could provide examples of uh, uh, countries uh, where regulation uh, favors the development of public access solutions, in most of the Western uh, countries, uh, I dare say that uh, the regulation is good enough to, to go for uh, extending the public access to the, the citizens. Uh, the only problem is that it's, uh, it's not the, 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 law, the laws themselves, but how they are interpreted by the dominant actors or players in the telecommunications uh, field. Uh, there is a strong interest in making or delivering the message that just very few things are uh, allowed and they are, by coincidence, are those that the big telecoms can do. And this is not exactly true. We have learned that there are many other options. Uh, it has not. So from what the legal uh, perspective is possible to what is implemented in reality, there is a, a big gap of a, 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 which can be transformed into opportunities. And this is what we have to learn with the collaboration of libraries and other uh, public access uh, points. So this would be more or less uh, what I would to say. I would like to say. Uh, no, I hand over to you, Valeria. Thank you very much, Roger, particularly for reminding us about the power of collective intelligence and shared knowledge creation and development. That's a crucial aspect of ensuring. Uh, and expanding access for sure. So next I have Peter uh, Misek. Um, Peter, I will also ask you to please uh, say a little bit about you and also uh, share you, say, say your view about the possibilities to offer public access. Uh, is, is it the conditional on installing filters or identifying users? What yeah. impact does this have on the effectiveness of public access solutions? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so first, I'm uh, Peter Meisek. I'm general counsel at Access Now. Uh, we are a, a global human rights organization that works at the intersection of human rights and technology and advocates for digital rights. Um, a couple things that we do uh, uh, that are relevant, I think, here are uh, first convening the RightsCon event series. Um, we'll, be, we'll be going to Tunisia in June of 2019 um, and, and hopefully welcoming a, a lot of these subjects there. Um, but uh, we also work closely on uh, data protection regulation, advancing that in, in both Europe and um, worldwide. And I think that's a really key issue uh, f that libraries and, and public access facilities um, can lead on is explaining to people their data protection rights um, and helping them exercise those rights. Uh, of course, uh, public access facilities should also do their best to respect data protection and privacy rights. Um, so from the legal perspective, um, I think there's a great uh, capacity for public access facilities uh, to provide notice uh, to users, to individuals, to their communities, notice of what their rights are and opportunities on how to exercise mm -hmm. those rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, starting with, with notice, um, I think we want people to understand the basics of what their rights are. So as a human rights organization, uh, we look to the, the global human rights instruments. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know, this toolkit is an opportunity to you know, distill some of the, the basic international norms uh, from things like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but also um, the new Sustainable Development Goals Commitment 1610, for example, uh, which um, provides for access to information. Um, that's part of your right to freedom of expression. Um, so, you know, the rights at their, ba at their base are data protection, privacy, and freedom of expression, which includes access to information um, from our perspective. And uh, taking them in, in, in that order, uh, we can look to laws like the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU as a place um, that clear, fairly, it's a, it is a complicated law, especially in its interpretation, but at its base, the rights are fairly simple. And, 
Um, uh, I think that uh, these public access facilities can can show people how um, they have they, uh, the right to know the purpose for which their data is being collected. Um, they have the right to access the data, um, their personal data that's held by entities who've collected it. They can modify and delete that data and they can object to its processing, um, which could include um, turning their, their personal data into profiles or it could include sharing with other entities. Um, and this includes uh, libraries. So libraries should strive to minimize the data that they collect, the personal data that they collect on individuals, um, and should uh, make it very clear how people can access the data that's held on them and, um, and modify and delete and, and object to processing of that data. And so, you know, this, this many, many countries, I think, are starting to pass data protection regulations and um, create these independent authorities. And so, um, just as individuals can go to the, say, the public access facility to exercise their data protection rights, um, they should also be shown where the local data protection authority is, and so they can go, you know, get the, uh, the government or the public body's support. Um, I do, yeah, I know the question was about, uh, the, like, um, sometimes that these facilities are required to um, put in place privacy invasive measures and technical filters that, that impact people's rights to privacy, data protection, and freedom of expression. Um, I think this, again, uh, yes, there, are, there can be legal requirements that, that we think often um, fall afoul of uh, international human rights law and norms. Um, but nonetheless, you know, are required. In these cases, I think, again, going back to notice, um, making people aware of these filters and of the requirements um, to, uh, you know, surveil your networks is, is one step you can take to build people's capacity to know their rights and to, to exercise them. So explain, you know, how a filter works, um, what, what it means that you don't get full search results um, in a certain database uh, because of censorship requirements and filtering. Um, explain a little bit about online privacy and uh, the fact that uh, when you're connecting to third parties over the internet, there are various points of vulnerability. And, um, you know, you, uh, if the law allows, it, it's best to explain to people how um, their own government might be taking advantage of these vulnerabilities, uh, including at these public access points. So I think, yeah, building that capacity for people to know what their rights are when they go into online spaces is um, one clear way, and I hope this toolkit does provide some um, examples. Uh, just to point to some Access Now materials and um, opportunities, we have built a um, guide um, on how individuals can exercise their data protection rights under laws like the GDPR. And so we have a fairly simple user guide um, that should be adaptable to many regions. I know we have we have that in French and um, English at our booth um, here in the village, for example. We also provide a help desk, a, a digital security helpline, and so that's um, a 24-hour service that operates in at least eight languages um, for free, providing civil society, um, and we interpret that very broadly, um, with free of charge, 24 by 7 um, digital security support, and that can be advice, it can be assessments, um, and uh, and recommendations on what tools, um, like secure browsing tools, um, encrypted messaging and networking, and email tools, um, uh, or it can be actual intervention when, when something's already gone wrong. So we aren't the only um, service that provides a digital security uh, helpline like this, the help desk, and uh, there are more um, regional and local help desks that are growing, and we're trying to foster a community of, of sharing of best practice in this area. And uh, again, happy to share that with this, um, the toolkit. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, I think it's interesting the link that you established between libraries and the exercise of human rights. It's uh, important to, I think, recognize that not only they are contributing these public facilities to access to information and, and knowledge, but perhaps creating these enabling environments for um, users to have control of their, their personal data and also reinforce the exercise of hu other human rights in online and offline. So next, I have. Um, Leandro Navarro from, from Pangea. 
Catalonia. And Leandro, I could like uh, uh, you to please let us know a little bit more about um, clearly many libraries and public access centers will look at traditional funders. Uh, local government, ministries responsible for digital affairs for support. Uh, what other potential sources of funding are there and how you can, uh, what you can share from your experience in terms of the sustainability, financial sustainability of these initiatives? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, when talking about uh, um, like uh, new forms or alternative forms of uh, financing and investment, Probably we also have to uh, recognize that there is also we need to broaden the view of uh, of, uh, of the role and, and the function of libraries. So uh, I was looking the other day on the Wikipedia to find the definition of library, and I like it very much. It talks about yeah a collection of uh, sources of information and similar resources which are accessible to a community for reference or, or borrowing. Uh, and well, the, later on it mentions that there is physical and digital uh, materials. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, food for thought on terms of the, that we, we recognize that the technological substrate of, uh, of uh, the libraries has changed a lot. And um, currently, um, as, as was said, um, uh, we need infrastructures to access either paper books or, or digital uh, materials. And, um, and they have to be universal. That's the... That's the main objective. Um, one of the aspects we, we are working uh, with, with Gifinet and, the, uh, and also now in the Gaia working group in IRTF is this idea of uh, universal models. So um, libraries sit into the, into the communities and, um, and, um, and infrastructure sharing is one way of, uh, in fact, financing by reducing the costs of uh, the infrastructure and, um, and, and the Giffen Foundation prepared a pro proposal of a municipal ordinance which uh, promotes um, the sharing and the co well the cost sharing and infrastructure sharing of between public, private, and community uses of infrastructure, um, so that the, let's say the public uh, land is not doesn't become privatized when someone deploys infrastructure. So communities can benefit from the reduction of costs in, in this case. Um, I don't know if you heard, but there are some, somewhere I found initiatives like uh, they talk about digital exchanges, which are like uh, infrastructures, like uh, uh, where you find um, small uh, racks where content can be stored, content produced locally can, can be stored, like imagine like a kind of public CDN in a way, or archive.org at the local level. Um, so um, these kind of infrastructures, uh, of course, are, um, are profitable, not in, not only, let's say, in the sense of economic profit. Private operators like the Googles and the Facebooks have demonstrated that it's possible to, to provide free service, let's say, in exchange of something. Um, but also there are social profits. And this social profit is benefits for uh, where everyone can contribute, everyone can benefit. That, that's the opportunity for, for uh, libraries. And, and regarding the sources of income to support that, to support that infrastructure, uh, well, the typical, uh, the typical model that the private industry uses is uh, they, they earn money from reselling our private data and seems to be quite profitable. Um, the typical way of uh, public uh, uh, services is taxes, and, and obviously there are m many opportunities. Um, since we have social impact, seems reasonable to go to some kind of uh, uh, sometimes global funds of that work with uh, they call it social impact funds social impact investment uh, typically pension funds and, and things like that which are, uh, want to invest in economic but mainly in social uh, profit um, there's a um, well criticized uh, universal service funds uh, model which the industry uh, pays to itself and, uh, and sometimes is paid to the one that is the main responsible of the problem. And, um, and, uh, but, but I've seen that there are interesting initiatives like, for instance, 
uh, what they call it connect connectivity bonds, which is uh, an, an, an amount of money given not to the provider but to the consumer so that he can use that bond to uh, find access to knowledge, content, and whatever uh, on its own, which uh, promotes uh, local developments, and that it can include also uh, public libraries. Of course, the Tobin tax uh, of uh, these um, uh, tax on speculative uh, operations that happen create a lot of value for a few, but not for everyone. And, and finally, uh, an interesting uh, possibility is uh, there's a recent discussion about, they call it the universal basic income, uh, and um, another kind of bond could be given to people to produce and acquire knowledge. Because in the end, when they produce and, and acquire knowledge, uh, we all benefit, uh, people make a bit more wise decisions, and, and creates more value for society. So, I mean, a universal basic income could be used to f support these, uh, let's say, knowledge workers that, uh, that um, can be useful for the local libraries, but also for the local, uh, the global movement. So, well, I mean, this is kind of our view of some opportunities. Thank you, Leandro. Definitely in terms of funding and sustainability, it's necessary to think out of the box and come up with more creative and innovative solutions. So uh, um, last but not least, I have Ma Maya Simoshivili from the National Parliamentary Le Library of Georgia. And Maya, uh, during the transition period from Soviet to Democratic Republic, what changes libraries as a community centers overcome? And is the role of libraries more important now in terms of providing affordable access? Thank you. Thank you for the giving opportunity to present my library here. Thank you to all people. Uh, the National Parliamentary Library is the main library in the country. And actually, uh, I have to mention that it's mostly public library. It's famous and it was founded as a public library in 1848. By 1848, but um, it became later during the war period for parliamentary library to defend its uh, bookstores and uh, to defend uh, all facilities from selling and from other problems. Uh, so we are uh, operating as a public library. Uh, the role of the library during the transition period was um, uh, so uh, not so big at the beginning because it was war and people need surviving and we needed to defend the buildings and uh, books and everything. But when I, uh, when today I compare uh, our development through 20 years, it's really clear and it's, um, we have some evidences. Uh, now, um, uh, so uh, when, the internet, uh, when the internet was expanded, and uh, I'm proud that Georgia is one of the most democratic country in the whole uh, region, in post-Soviet region, really. Uh, from, we don't have any censorship in internet. Everybody can watch and look and write everything, what they, whatever they want. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, good or bad, but I think it's um, good because people can overcome any problems and any issues, but uh, they begin to think about it. And uh, now for today, uh, we have a, a very brand new digital library with new collections, we have, we have new catalog systems and what's much more important, we have public access. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, 10 years ago, it was idea that libraries are not needed anymore uh, because there is an internet and everybody can find something in internet. But today we see it has changed and people trust library much more than, uh, for example, um, uh, sometimes uh, Google because of so sources. We have to be responsible for sources. We have to defend our copyrights uh, and copyrights what we uh, are presenting. Um, and uh, during this period also, uh, since 2012, uh, the library began new project, Equilibrium, and it um, also uh, equipped 
uh, more than 150 libraries in villages with computers, with internet access. Okay, in villages they are not Wi-Fi access expanded yet. Uh, in our library and in the city we all, almost all have Wi-Fi at home too. 80% of the uh, citizens uh, in the city have uh, internet and 50% uh, in the villages have internet. But we need to, uh, we need this broadband connection uh, to remote regions uh, to expand it. And uh, what I want also to mention, the library now began to collaborate with business sector. It's a real big problem uh, about regulations because we don't have the love of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. What means that business, especially in the post-Soviet world, you know how businesses is made, mm -hmm. mostly, uh, and these people don't uh, want to give money for uh, not to have a gain. Of, of course, it's clear. And therefore, we need uh, philanthropy laws so that they are able to give culture more funding and to give education more funding. Uh, so we would be very happy about it because uh, now it's on personal level that some businessmen agree to fund, uh, to co cooperate with us. But we have um, quite normal results for this situation. Um, also, the other issue is that library education was collapsed at the Soviet uh, collapsed. It was not perfect uh, during this time, but uh, now we have uh, the library education in only one institution, but we don't have PhD niveau yet. So uh, I have to say that the staff of the National Parliamentary Library, who is 400 people, are the only staff who knows this librarianship from the beginning uh, till end. But what we really need is new technologies. For example, uh, we really we have digital um, collections, but we need uh, new technologies. We need, uh, you know, some digital databases have also video access, public access. Uh, um, interview matter, everything uh, um, uh, connected and involved in one package sometimes. I, I, I'm talking about the best digital libraries in the world. Uh, so we need this technical facility, of course, and we need also some training so to expand and to develop. And um, so um, if you have any questions. Thank you, Maya. Yes, let me open the floor for reactions, questions, or comments uh, uh, to the interventions that we have heard from the speakers. Yes. Before, yes. Thank you. Um, this is a very interesting uh, point about the dynamic between uh, public services and commercial services and uh, the view that libraries uh, take away business from commercial interests is is an old one, uh, if misplaced, going back to books themselves. Why would anybody ever buy a book if they could get it at the library? Uh, what happened, of course, was that libraries created readers that wanted their own books. And I'd say that the model applies today in the digital environment where uh, people uh, have an experience of uh, technology at a library and uh, appreciate the value of it and then can justify uh, spending their own money for it. So it, for, for us, it's uh, really a natural partnership that uh, the library offers a basic level, not unlimited of course, of services and products that can then generate uh, demand for products. I also had a question, if I may, for uh, Leandro on, on the uh, financing or the provisions uh, of, uh, of infrastructure. And I know that uh, the models in developed markets do not necessarily apply in other places. What we've seen in the, in the U.S. anyway is a change in the rules under un universal service where they were, uh, as you say, uh, companies providing services and paying themselves to do it through these funds. What was changed several years ago was that uh, rather than restricted to commercial services providers providing uh, connections to uh, libraries uh, and schools, uh, anyone could do that. So uh, libraries and schools could build their own networks with the same funds uh, or other nonprofits could provide those same services like the, uh, uh, the research and education networks, 
uh, and even municipalities themselves could qualify for those funds. And that has made a big difference in uh, the motivations for what kind of services to provide. And I was curious whether you thought there are prospects for that kind of change in the way no, uh, USF funds are normally uh, managed. Let me check if there is any other question so we have a round of responses, if possible. If there is any other question or comment, now would be the time to pose it for the, for the panel. Uh, just a comment. My name is uh, Dr. Tan Tho Kang from Myanmar. I'm from Myanmar Book Aid and Preservation Foundation. Uh, it's very inspirational talk, actually. Uh, I would like to share my experience in Myanmar. We have a project called Beyond Assess, Myanmar project, which is actually Beyond Assess is a custodian of 11 organizations. IFA is one of them, actually. So what we just now the gentleman here pointed out is that the sustainability of the public library is so important. So we have to prove one thing, which is the ownership, ownership to the community. If we can give the ownership to the community, that's that solve a lot of problems. So let's see, I, I want to give you one example. Through, through this uh, project, we provided actually three things. One is internet, two is devices, and three is a training. And then we supported to this community library with four tablets. Cost about maybe total $500. Then community started to show these, uh, the knowledge that's from the online contents to the nearby school. The students started to come. Then always this library is crowded with the students. Then once this community started to see, they put up their own funding to build a new uh, classroom for ICT training. So that's the same things uh, that we see is very uh, inspirational, sustainable, I mean. So that's, at this moment, we are working with uh, 150 libraries across the country. And that's why the, we have to give the ownership. We, we say that we are going to give only four tablets and internet, that's it, and we, tra we train them. Then they, they carry on the themselves. So that's this kind of model, the ownership model, it works in our country. Thank you. Okay, so um, Leandro, I think there are a couple of questions for you, but the other speakers are also free to jump in and provide their perspective. So one <coughs> quick comment is, uh, I think the problem of universal service funds is that the name is, is too nice. Uh, but the, in, in most cases that I know, it's used to uh, simply um, reduce the cost uh, of some connections and then uh, governments choose the biggest telecom provider, which is typically the case, the, the cause of the problem, and they, they get a tax reduction paid by the other uh, telecom providers in the country. So it's a, it's a very unfair mechanism, simply that is called universal service. Uh, I, I'm really glad to see that there are more examples of, uh, of uses of that, um, those uh, funds, which are quite big. I saw uh, the Alliance for Affordable Internet Access has one article saying that uh, they have about, there are about more than $400 million uh, sitting there uh, waiting to be used. Uh, and let's not talk about the, the ones that are used. So yeah, I think it's, it shouldn't be uh, I mean, universal access is, is, a, is a public problem. It's not just a pri private business. And um, it's important to give these funds to the trusted entities which are a really able to, which are really interested in, in solving the problem, not in preserving the problem for, for the future as a tax incentive. We take one more question or comment and then we go to the final remarks. Thank you, Valeria. And um, thank you, Dan, from for uh, also bringing the questions here. I very much agree with, uh, um, I, I, I'm really interested in the concept that Leandro shared about universal models and how libraries are actually everywhere and they, they solve a problem that, is every, uh, that happens everywhere and in a, in a very similar fashion. Uh, but also, I, I, and I'm curious uh, in this sense how libraries will be a key actor in the public access or uh, access in general uh, problem. And uh, I think we, every part of the, the actors that are involved in this problem needs to play a role and we need to identify exactly what the role of the libraries are gonna be. Uh, and uh, in, the, in this sense, librarians, I, I believe that 
can be uh, the actor within the communities that facilitate a process of engagement with the communities. Uh, like the governments will be those, or need to be those, they need to step up uh, to provide the, the, the conditions for the uh, people to be connected, but uh, the governments can go be on the field. Uh, they, they are not there with the communities together, and this is actually the case for libraries. Uh, so I'm eager uh, to listen more about the progress of this space in particular because the librarians are there in the field. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Nicolas, so can I ask the speakers to just uh, provide some final remarks in less one than minute each so we can make it so in terms of the time of the session. You'll be talking about a uh, connection between libraries and schools. We have some uh, poor students who are not able to buy books, uh, school books, and therefore our library provides uh, the books uh, via online, via public access, and they can without buying study from the library web pages. So uh, uh, every student who are not able to buy these uh, books for schools, they can uh, study by our library. So it's what can, we can do now. Roger, Peter, and then. Thank you. Uh, Don was uh, discussing the, the relation between public services and, and, and commercial services. And we have a, 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 a practical case in my village where we uh, used the library to connect uh, the houses and now more than 90% of the hou uh, households uh, are connected to professional services delivered on a common shared infrastructure. And this is a nice case that makes clear that the library helped to uh, uh, spread uh, the digital world among population, but at the same time, it drives up uh, a market. So this is a perfect case. And we are talking about the village of uh, 350 inhabitants, no more than uh, 100 houses altogether. And then a comment regarding the Myanmar's gentleman. Uh, we also have a case here. Uh, he said he proposed to transfer ownership to the community as a, a solution to legal problems, and, and Gifinet again is a case of this. Uh, we built or uh, we set up a foundation uh, in 2008, and now the foundation takes the liability of those infrastructures that are made available by third parties, like uh, libraries. So instead of, if there is any legal problem, instead of going to each specific library, they go to us and we have gathered some knowledge regarding these issues and we can provide a better response to that. Thanks. I just would like to quickly respond to Nico, um, who asked uh, uh, what is the role of um, libraries and librarians and uh, I think uh, in my opinion, um, it is, uh, it's a very difficult question because libraries are so heterogeneous and, uh, and they are influenced by um, the place in the world where they are, uh, the, the, the governance structure that they abide to or follow. So there is not a, an answer for all, right? So it's a very localized uh, answer, the one that we have to look for. And in my experience, one uh, way to find the answer is to uh, carry out uh, in depth uh, um, community needs assessment, which not only um, highlight what that specific community really needs, because uh, they might not really need a certain kind of connectivity, they might need something else. And that also, in that process, you also um, uh, have the ability to uh, assess uh, what the community has to offer. And in that moment, with those two elements, what the needs are, what the community has, you can find a solution that is, uh, um, as we heard many times, bottom-up, because the top-down solutions, they don't work uh, for uh, 
um, many realities. So to me, the, 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 the way the libraries and librarians can facilitate that is like to provide that sort of knowledge together with, of course, other sorts of expertise. Yeah, I, sorry, uh, no, uh, it's interesting uh, uh, while I was hearing you. I, uh, I believe that also the, the community, I, I come from the community networks territory, and we have so much to learn about the librarians. Uh, this process was not like from like from the night to the morning, right? It's not that libraries appear there. They, it was a progressive thing that covered the whole world. So there's another collaboration there in ex in the experience transfer. You know, like moving from what the libraries are, wh where the libraries were, to where they are now, and how did this happen? And this ether etherogeneous se setup. I think it's extremely valuable to find these spaces to discuss about these things. I, want, I don't want to take all the time, sorry, but I just want to say that IFLA is working on this uh, interesting tool that is the uh, uh, library map of the world, and essentially we're providing an online tool to uh, gather some uh, facts uh, and numbers about libraries. and. Uh, we are now at the point uh, where, and we're still counting, we have sort of uh, a, a number which is above two million in the world of libraries of all sorts. So, I mean, there is a, <laughs> there is a, a lot of richness in there and, uh, and I think together we can really address these issues. And Nico, uh, sure. some final remarks and then? Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think this was a really rich discussion. And um, on the funding piece, I think uh, we all know how important information technology is to the future of libraries and public access points. Um, you know, to date, uh, that has largely been a, an area of innovation controlled by the private sector. So I do think uh, it's incumbent on, you know, the businesses have a, a responsibility to um, support uh, public access facilities. Um, both in kind um, through tech transfers and in funding. Um, we've seen you know, efforts by um, companies like Mozilla and Microsoft and others to fund um, uh, development projects uh, extending connectivity. Uh, and, and this should be, this should continue and increase. However, I do think that um, many of these projects do, can suffer from the sort of top-down um, um, issues and, and not really take into consideration the local context and, and for these reasons, you know, I would, um, I would support that uh, more of this, this sort of funding go to um, uh, empower local communities to, to better understand their legal rights and risks and then find the right technological solutions which are often open source. Um, based products and services um, which are maybe using alternative forms of networking and, and energy use and, and storage um, to, to have a more sustainable and uh, kind of rights respecting um, approach to connectivity. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think the other place that I see real human rights science is, um, is in understanding uh, this, this uh, fire hose of information that can really get unleashed on people and I, um, and a lot of the human rights discussions, you know, people are concerned about disinformation and willful misinformation and um, that I uh, just want to emphasize that we really depend on um, these, these figures in local communities to help people sort through information. Thanks. Thank you all the speakers for the insights and I think now I hand it over to Esmeralda to just let us know the next steps in terms of finalizing the, the toolkit and the work of the VCTs and then with that we close the session. So uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, the toolkit uh, is now on its um, second iteration and uh, it is available on the IGF website. For comments, um, I think the Secretariat placed my um, you know, like email address as a, a, a place where you can send any comment you might have. So I am, um, we're looking forward to receive your suggestion and feedbacks. Hopefully, if uh, those could reach us before the Christmas holidays, that would be great, um, so that we could spend um, 
the next um, months to integrate the comments and uh, solidify the toolkit and share it again for a final revision. So if you have any questions, of course, you can uh, talk to any of us um, or myself after this. And I thank you very much for being here. And um, thank you for your participation. Mics are still open. Eh? Uh, since we've closed, though, but we're still here, I wanted to respond to this and, and emphasize this uh, community-centric approach to uh, uh, what Stephen met, said in the opening, his opening remarks. Mostly we're talking about libraries, but we're also talking about any kind of uh, local community facility that, that that community rallies around and trusts, whatever it is. Libraries are, many of us are the ideal of that, but it's not necessarily so. Uh, and also that the, this, it represents this global platform of uh, knowledge and skills. And as an ancient uh, profession, uh, it's already at a, a starting point to build on. So to leverage that at the local level and at the global level, it seems like a way to bring this into almost any conversation about connectivity and access and build out and the rest of it. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. This is a very enjoyable session today. I appreciate it. Maybe since you are here, just one quick uh, com comment final to, uh, to, to live with the libraries. I don't know if you know, there's a book from Jorge Luis Borges called uh, The Aleph which explains that, um, yeah, I mean, libraries are nice when there is little access to knowledge, but when you find all the knowledge in, a, in an orb, in a, in a bowl, you get caught by it in, and you, you, you die of access of information. So I think trust assistance from libraries, uh, from experts in, in knowledge management we are needed, and, and people shouldn't be just a consumer of information, but also a producer. And there's so much locally to be, to be made accessible, and people can do that. So if there is so, such, a, such an amount of, um, of uh, social value, there must be funding, there must be ways to, to make it work. Uh, uh, one comment. Ah, you no, be answered. You be ahead, answered. Please. Uh, I can only say that uh, library now are not books only bookstore anymore. Uh, they become more cultural, vibrant centers. For example, we had uh, 13 e events on one day. See, 13 different events, and I think that uh, it's only attitude that uh, people, government, and business people uh, don't get that uh, library become more cultural centers, and it's not only about bookstores where you they are going and studying uh, boring uh, um, uh, lessons. So it's much more now. It gives uh, the social importance. It's uh, it gives a possibility to connectivity to all cities and actually by the law uh, in the world world li uh, libraries are more democratic place where everybody can come anytime and uh, it's open to everybody and I think that we can use this opportunity very well for citizens sorry for the interruption I did not know Great. Uh, if I might make a plug for the digital inclusion and accessibility session in uh, room one in uh, five minutes. Yeah, on our website, but it's been developed. Yeah. Yeah. It's been developed. Yeah.